and I look over here and I see a stream monitor. I just want to make sure there's no red and it looks like we are live. I'm just going to double check. And I'm going to look at my LinkedIn first because that usually comes up as a notification and boom, we are live. Rocking it on PPE this, with, with Scott Margolin or a Margolin. Say it for me. I'll answer to almost anything. Margolin. Margolin. Okay. Jeez, I've, I've said it 16 different ways. Margolin. Margolin. It's like a, that's a, <laughs> what is that? It's like a good Italian name, Margolin. <laughs> that's what everybody thinks. It's actually, uh, the family's probably originally from Russia, Ukraine, that area, if you go back far uh, enough. Well, see, yeah. Croatian. So mm -hmm. there you go. Dimitrovic. Well, thank you, Scott, for joining us. And um, we are going to be talking. This is, as you know, very well much know, this is Safety Month, Electrical Safety Month. And we're talking personal protective equipment. I had uh, Jimmy on yesterday, and you know all about Jimmy. And, and, and from an electrical worker's perspective, um, I'm going to have a session coming up talking about getting out of the arc flash boundary and all this other good stuff. And I always... Uh, Felix Sandoval. So we're international too. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So like Felix uh, is out of Colombia and then we'll have uh, some people from Japan and other countries. So I don't know if, well, I mean, I always say electrons don't know what country they're in. <laughs> right? they <don't. laughs> so, uh, but uh, so welcome to this program and I'm enjoying, I'm going to absolutely thoroughly enjoy our discussion. I know you are as energetic as as anything. So uh, that's what I love about you. But why don't you do me a favor and just tell everybody who you are, give a little bit, a lot of your background, let everybody know you come from a position of authority when it comes to personal protective equipment. Well, they can make that uh, their minds up for themselves on that part. But uh, <laughs> I basically get paid to blow stuff up. So I have a pretty cool job. Uh, short version of the background, six years in the fire service in college. 10 years at DuPont and the Kevlar and Nomex businesses, including leading the Nomex flash fire business and the NASCAR business for a while. That was fun. Uh, and then 16 years at West Tex as their international technical director. So from a, from a global perspective, I've been all over the planet pretty much except Antarctica, obviously, talking about this stuff. Uh, and then joined Tyndale five years ago where I'm vice president of technical. Uh, so basically, I also chair the ASTM F1959 arc rating standard and both home and industrial laundering standards. Uh, seen probably in the neighborhood of 3,000 arc flashes at laboratories, of course, all over the planet. So uh, the goal of a lot of that work is besides giving folks training materials to see what we can learn about the hazard, what the PBE does in that hazard, and how to improve both the training and the PPE as a result. Absolutely. And so so testing PPE, I mean, we I know we blow stuff up, love to blow stuff up, but we we look at it from, I look at it from an electrical equipment uh, in fact, right now, we're doing some IEEE testing down in our St. Louis uh, facility to look at that low end, that single phase, when it doesn't sustain itself and all that good stuff. So I've been peeking in on that, uh, that stuff over there on, the, on, the, on my computer. So been there many times. It's a super cool lab. Anybody who's on this who hasn't seen it and gets the opportunity, you should. And for nothing else, there's a giant metal picture of Vince there now. <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. I got some pictures of me. I do selfies in front of it, and I go, ah. <laughs> And then I send them to them. But uh, yeah, we called it the Sa Vince Saparita Training Center now. So that, yep. yeah, so, and I bless him. So and he's doing good these days too. He's retired and enjoying himself. All right. So we're going to talk personal protective equipment. We have a, a good outline. I think we talked about, uh, to the uh, an overview would be, you know, you're selecting personal protective equipment, donning the PPE and then cleaning the PPE. So the, the first step of everything, and I know there's two methods in 70E. You got the table method, which is sort of a, when you're in a non-labeled environment, how to pick your PPE. And then you have an, a, 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 the, ver, the, ca the calories calculation. And those two tables are a little different in what you wear, but they give you a pretty good prescriptive, right? I mean, is that, is that the only thing that you use to determine what you need to wear? No, uh, you typically would want to be really sure that you're, uh, in theory, you're not supposed to use the tables to calculate rather, and then to use the tables. Yeah. So if you've done the calculations and it's cat two, uh, but the way the real world works, uh, that's how the stuff is labeled. I mean, there's gonna be a little logo right there or somewhere on the garment that says, you know, nine calories, eight calories, cat two, whatever it says. At any rate, you're, you're supposed to either use the tables or calculate. 
Either way, the goal is, is extraordinarily simple on all the fancy words and FPA 70 side. There's a hazard there. You can measure, measure that hazard, the arc incident energy, the higher the number, the higher the hazard. Match this to it. Number one, don't wear fuel. What you're wearing oh, right yeah. now burns, this doesn't, right? That's the life and death difference. Don't wear fuel. What you're wearing won't ignite, continue to burn. We'll show you a video, video in a minute. And number two, make sure that what you're wearing insulates to the hazard you are about to face. So that if you walk up to the gear and there's a sticker on it and it says six calories and you're in an 8.7 calorie shirt, you're good to go. Okay. If it says nine calories and you're in an 8.7 calorie shirt, you need to layer up. Okay, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. I remember someone telling me that isn't there so, but like if I calculate seven calories, do I wear seven calories or do we tell people to wear more? So it meets or exceeds. Now, if it was me, in theory, you're legally okay in a seven calorie arc with a 7.0 calorie shirt. Right. And in practice, you're probably okay as well uh, for a variety of reasons I'll get into in a second. But if it was me, I'd like a little margin of error. <laughs> it's <laughs> true. You're going to find that. Uh, you know, so we talk about arcs uh, you know, with 8.7 or 6, whatever. There's a decimal place. The science, in my personal opinion, is not that precise. An arc is an extraordinarily energetic thing. It, it, it's almost like, like a liquid. It's plasma. It flows. And so, you know, it, we have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. So we draw it at 4 and 8 and 25 and 40. But uh. you know, the practical difference between 7.9 and 8, not the legal difference, is, is infinitesimal when it comes to a garment. So why did I say a moment ago that um, the shirts, so what we're testing, and we'll show you this shortly, is a piece of fabric about the size of this paper towel, mm -hmm. and it's flat to a sensor. There's an arc on the outside, that the heat goes through the fabric, and there's a thermocouple on the other side that measures heat transfer. We don't want any second degree burn. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into that, but yep. the fact is a shirt has a whole, how much of this is one layer? Well, both pockets are two layers. The pocket flaps are three mm -hmm. layers. The placket is two or three layers. The collars, you know, so, and it's also not worn super tight to your body unless you, you know, showing off. So anyhow, uh, we, the arc, arc ratings are a terrific way to judge the performance of these garments. Uh, and in most times in real life, the garment's actually going to outperform the arc rating by a little bit for the reasons I just mentioned. Yeah. And, and in reality, like I did a case analysis with, um, with Ken White, we did an IEEE paper for the workshop where they calculated based upon the clearing times, the published clearing times of our overcurrent device, like say, I don't know, uh, two point something calories with the arc reduction magnet switch on. But when the event occurred, it, there was no damage in there other than the size of a dime. But you know, two calories is a significant event, right? It's, it's nothing to shake a stick at. There was no way it was a two calorie event. Yeah, so a couple of thoughts there. One, I completely agree, Tom. There's no such thing as a small arc. Anybody who's ever been in front of one. Yeah. Uh, so the bottom line, even if the arc doesn't sustain an error, you mentioned the single phase earlier, or even if it's 120, 240 volts, unlikely to sustain an error. Uh, the bottom line is that all those create molten metal, typically copper. It takes 1,906 degrees Fahrenheit to melt copper. Your skin burns at 140, cotton ignites at 425. There will be molten metal spewing everywhere That's at true. 2,000 degrees. That math is not complicated. There's a reason that the first industry in the United States that went into flame-resistant clothing was the steel industry. Because yeah. 60 years ago, they recognized molten metal ignites cotton, right? It ain't yep. rocket science. Yep. Uh, yep. So, Yeah. I can remember my dad worked at Jones and Lachlan Steel Corporation and he had those green clothing that he would bring home and they were always dirty, right? But he all, he used to teach us as a kid about the cotton would burn and, and all this other good stuff. But we never, you know, we weren't really, we weren't, I wasn't working in that environment, but he knew all about that. And that was, that was in the seventies and the eighties. You know? Yeah, that was a, a Westex product, believe it or not, called ProBan FR7A if it was green. That's and right. it was a big, but anyhow, so relevant to our audience today, We've known for that long molten metal ignites cotton, and yet it took a couple of revision cycles of NFPA 70E for, for the, the, those folks to recognize that and eliminate category zero. Excellent, excellent. I just want to make sure everybody out there understands we're not in the same library. I'm on the other side. Okay, <laughs> I'm on the other side. Yours is much better lit than mine. So I thought I'd match Tom's vibe here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, okay, so... So we calculate the, the the calories, or I use the table method, one or the other, and I'm either going to I'm either going to get into if it's the table method, I'm in I'm in 130.7C15, and and I'm looking at my arc flash categories, and it tells me that I need a long sleeve shirt, a face shield, and all this other good stuff. 
and 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 the balaclava, right? And I need to know. I, in some case, I need to protect my bare skin and my neck and all this other good stuff. Um, so I, the first one in my mind was the the whole. If it's an eight calorie event, do I wear eight calories? Okay, and and I get that now. I feel comfortable with that. The fabric, the the knowing the right PPE. I mean, I've gone to Cabela's and I've seen uh, stuff on the shelf that says FR, and uh, but that's not the same as ARC rated, right? So I I I'd love to have that discussion on the proper picking the right clothing. What do we look for? That's, uh, how much time you have? <laughs> that's a huge conversation. So <laughs> let's let's take those in order. Um, and I'll come back to the Cabela's thing in a moment. I love that store for my fishing needs, but I would not buy my arc rated clothing. So flame resistant versus arc rated. Uh, that confuses a lot of folks. The question we most often get is I'm in my arc rated clothing. I got to work tomorrow inside the fence of a petrochemical facility where they require FR. Are they going to let me in? If they know what they're doing, yes. And here's why. All arc rated clothing is flame resistant. It has to be flame resistant and proven as such just to get in the arc rated test. Uh. So again, all AR is FR, but not all flame resistant clothing is arc rated. Why? Well, let's say the, the, the welders greens you were talking about or the steel industry, why would they test it to arc if it's never gonna be used for arc, it's gonna be used for molten metal. You know, it's, it takes, takes time, it's expensive. There's different things you have to pass that right. would make the welding garment more expensive. So anyhow, not all flame resistant fabrics have been arc tested, but one last time, all arc rated fabrics are flame resistant as proven by a test called ASTM D6413. Test. That's a prerequisite. Well, oh, you broke up there a little bit. Oh no! You're back. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. You there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I the screen went entirely black. I didn't know what happened. Yeah, you just sort of you, you sort of uh, you sort of broke up right when you were talking about the ASTM standard, and then you came back. So you're good. That's weird. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So all FR, uh, all AR is FR, but not vice versa. Right. So, in terms of the fabrics, I, I would like to urge caution. As I mentioned at the outset here, I spent 25 years of my career in the fibers and fabrics. That said, you know, 25 years ago or 20 when NFPA 70 came out, 94 when the utilities started to get into arc-rated clothing, the the just like the cell phone I pull out of my pocket today is dramatically different from the cell phone oh, we yeah. all had back then. Yep. So is the technology that makes this stuff FR. So way back the first question when you were picking this stuff was is it really fr for the life of the garment who says so what's that guarantee based on is there a guarantee yep. how do i know who do i trust right today yep. the significant majority of fibers and fabrics made in the united states are fr for the life of the garment and everything that my company tyndale sells everything is guaranteed fr does not matter how many times you launder it so that piece is generally over the last decade been put aside and people now are more focused when they pick the right fabric. Yeah. All right. What's your hazard? Flash fire, arc flash, combustible dust, molten metal. What is it? That's critical, obviously. Right. Select the right um, hazard, the right fabric options, garment options for that hazard. Number two, typically what you're looking for after that is the flame resistant durability. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, hopefully you're dealing with either you have an expert in your company or you have an, an expert on our side of the fence, right? Who you can talk to. Mm -hmm. Then you're looking at, you know, what, what um, arc ratings do I need? Is it cat one, is it cat two? What most people will do, very few people will supply cat one, two, three, and four. They'll typically supply cat two daily wear and say, when you get to something that's over eight calories, the label on the gear, or you've done the calculation, you go grab either your 25 or your 40 cal flash suit, put it on over top, or in some other way, layer up. Right. Uh, so that you really, most people are set on mode cat two, cat four, and not in between. So you need that piece of it when you're selecting the right PPE. And then, only then, typically, do you come to, well, it should be comfortable. Yeah. And it should be a good value proposition. And ideally, uh, we'll, we'll talk about comfort at some point here, I'm sure. But ideally, you want to give people choice. The number one predictor of comfort is not fabric weight or air permeability or moisture regain. or It's choice. Yeah, yeah. Go to the beer aisle. Go to the cereal aisle. Americans like choice. Absolutely. Give them some choice. Yeah. From all that other stuff that you've already decided was appropriate for your hazard and your company's image needs. And then style. And so style is stunningly important for comfort. You know, you go to shop for clothing in your personal life. I bet you've never walked into wherever you shop and said, show me the rack with the lightest clothing in here. <laughs> what do you do? You know, or show me the rack that handles sweat the best. Yeah. If you go to a brand that you like or a style that you like or a color. And only then do you 
right? So You're absolutely right. those things are all important to choosing the right stuff. And then the last piece that's absolutely vital that's often overlooked is the supplier. You know, if you don't have a good supplier, it doesn't matter how good the stuff you're getting is. And especially during COVID, there's all kinds of extra stuff to worry about. But anyhow, oh, all man. those things are relevant. We can talk about any of those in more depth that you'd like. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. So, so I'm, I'm going to, so, so I, I, I've got the calories and I've, I know my, um, um, you know, I want to pick, obviously everybody has their personal preferences, whether it's light or all the other good stuff. And then looks are always, I mean, you got to look good, right? So, <laughs> I mean, that's the other big thing there. And, but what about if I'm working in rain, uh, like, you know, do, do they make PPE that, I mean, rain, rain gear is always, I, I would think it would just melt. I mean, and, and it will if it's not flame resistant and arc rated. So there's a bunch of layers to that. First of all, um, if you're working in the rain, yeah, you would you would typically want arc rated rain gear. Now, is your hazard arc or fire? Most of the time, the significant majority of the time, garments that are good for flash fire are good for arc flash and vice versa, despite the ARFR thing, because most of the popular stuff in this country today is dual hazard. Mm -hmm. That said, if you're very used to that, stop. That's not stop, that's time out. Stop. <laughs> And think about the rainwear because there's a, a, a significant, what is in my opinion, when I go to my opinion, I cover my Tindo logo, just Scott's opinion. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my opinion, there's an issue with the rainwear. So ASTM D6413 is a vertical flame test. And what you do, you take a piece of fabric, you put a fire, a Bunsen burner underneath it. I don't know mm -hmm. if that's really going to. And then obviously if it burns, it's not flame resistant. If it doesn't burn, it'll have some damage. It'll be charred. Right. right. And then you can measure that char length and you get a, an answer in ASTM F1506, the ASTM standard that governs all this for ARC. It's six inches or less, it's, it's FR. So what happens, that same picture, you've got a Bunsen burner here from like your high school chemistry class and you put rain wear, that plasticky rubbery stuff over it. What's yep. it gonna do? It's gonna shrink away from that's it. That's right, it? yeah, that's right. And so you get these fake, I hate to say false passes, but stuff will pass the test that shouldn't. That was never designed <clears throat> for those sorts of textiles. Yeah. So with that, with that, uh, there's a piece of video here if you want to call it up in a sec, we'll, we'll show you the, the differences, but there's ASTM F1891 for arc flash and 2733, I believe, for flash fire. You, in my opinion, absolutely only want to look at rainwear that passes 1891 because it not only tests for flame resistance, it also tests it in an arc, which is your hazard. Nice. What's the video? Um, which video am I looking for? So this could be one that uh, says um, 6413 Rainwear, one of those. I got uh, Rasco, I got PSPS, Kima, non-FR, arc resistance, cotton, non-FR, shirt, arc flash, FR versus non-FR, and then... No I guess it's not there. Uh, you no, know well, what? Uh, wait a second. It's, is it on your website? Because um, It is, but... I have. I don't know if we want to take that time up now. But. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I had uh, you know, and I remember I was looking at it on your, and if you know what, as we're talking. So anyway, so, um, I saw because so, anyway. So, so what you would see, our website, these videos are all free. They're downloadable. Help yeah. yourself. There's literally several hundred. But this particular one, if you have a 6413 FR rainwear, you put it in the R, like we do with all our other stuff. Yeah. You're going to see. Boom, a lot of it just kind of goes into molten polymer and it's all over the place. The back wall, the floor, your face. Some of it's on fire. It's not a horrific fire, but there's some fire. And half or two thirds of the garment's gone. Contrast that with uh, 1891 with the good rainwear test rainwear and exactly what you'd expect happens. You hit it with a great big arc and there is no fire. There is no melting. There are no holes. It's intact and it insulated you to the hazard. Yeah, is this it? Oh. Yeah, so that's the 1891 one. That's the good test. That okay. guy's a clown. But. Yeah, he is a clown. I, I know him. I don't know if you know him, but man. So there's, yeah, that's the bad rain. Well, I shouldn't say bad. That is 6413 rainwear. And you can see there that it's on fire. Yeah. It blew up. That's not supposed to happen. And these are narrated, obviously. You don't need us. But so there's a nice close look from GoPro. We like to destroy GoPros. They're pretty good. Man. And GoPro. you can see that that's not what's supposed to happen. Yeah, it, it just gets the FR label uh, because it's put in the FR test and it's not appropriate, in my opinion, for arc rated rainwear. And I got a test of it is that's a vertical flame test we were just talking about. Oh, so that's where you're saying it pulls away. Yeah. Okay. 
And this, now this is an actual arc rating test itself of the fabric. So that happens to be NASCO fabric, which are a terrific rainwear manufacturer partner of ours. And you can see it charged instead of burning, but it's not on fire. It didn't break open. It didn't melt, right? It, it protected. Yeah. This is actually a longer video than uh, I had attempted to send and obviously failed to do that. Oh, that's do. okay. I, what I'm doing is I'm just fast forwarding. Now, what are they doing here? So we're doing, uh, th in this case, there's a whole bunch of other tests in, in ASTM. You want your rainwear to stop water, right? So I have oh, to yeah. test this in there. It kind of makes sense. It's rainwear. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. you're going to test the seams. Uh, there's, so there's all kinds of good tests in there. And this test series, by the way, there's probably 30 or 40 videos now. Each of them, most of them, 60 seconds or 90 seconds or less uh, that talk about each of the individual tests that are relevant in this industry. So what you're but saying... Anyhow, you're saying that you can, you can, there's, there's one test, which is just a flame right. and, 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 and then it pulls away, but then these, so you can buy rainwear that has been tested with an arc or an arc in front of it, as opposed to just a flame underneath it. Exactly. How right. do I and tell so the difference? Do, so you want to look in the labeling when they say it's flame resistant, does it say ASTM D6413 or does it say, and that is, the appropriate test for textile fabrics that are not rainwear. It is not the appropriate test for rainwear. Uh -huh. You want in ARC ASTM F1891. F that is the rainwear test that says, all right, we're going to flat, we're going to test it in vertical flame, but we're also going to test it in an ARC. And we're going to test right. it at double its ARC rating to make sure it doesn't melt there. And we're going to make sure it's waterproof and the seams are waterproof. Nice. All good stuff that's supposed to protect you from water and ARCs. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so F1891 is what you're looking for. Um, Okay, so we got rainwear, we got the fabric. Uh, the, what about? Um, uh, okay, d d if I the, the clothing is it shock? I mean, we're, we're talking about arc flash. If I'm wearing my PPE and I have exposed, um, you know, 480 volts or whatever, and I my elbow touches it with my personal protective equipment, does this prevent shock? No, uh, okay. no more than any of, well, if it's the standard arc rate of textiles. So for shock, uh, I'm obviously, I'm going to get my gear bag out. I don't know if that's, that's not coming up on camera. There it is. There yep. I'm going to get my gear bag out and in my gear bag are going to be another gear bag. Right. Yep. And I'm going to have my voltage rated gloves and my leather keepers. Right. And hopefully uh, I'm also going to have, if I'm, if I'm really running the risk of touching something, I might have the, the rubber sleeves, but you need rubber goods, obviously. Okay. Uh, for protection from shock and EH rated boots, not just the toe of the boot being uh, compression oh. resistant and puncture resistant, but EH rated boots ideally. And then, you know, this is not so much for shock, but you're going to go with the other hard PPE. These are super cool. The new lift, uh, it's not really showing, but the new lift front go. hoods. Yeah. They're yep. really cool. And they come with a shroud, so you don't need a balaclava, which a lot of people don't find comfortable. Oh. So that's a new design uh, that, that, Anyway, it's an ensemble, in other words. So to your point, obviously, shock is another hazard here. Yeah. And we need the appropriate rubber goods for shock. And this PPE doesn't cover your face or your hands. Right. The hard hat and face shield do. Okay. So you got, you got, you got the, 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 the garment itself, which is the, the, the protection. You talked about the helmet and the balaclava. And you can get away from not using the balaclava if you use the new stuff with the, with the, the, the nice uh, drape around the back. Yeah, like that. Okay, so that's perfect. So that that gets you away from that tight balaclava that probably somebody else wore yesterday, and you got to put that on today, right? So then, yep. then the other the other aspect is um, you mentioned boots and shoes. So there's arc rated boots too. Well, not arc rated per se. There's EH. So they're what they're going to do. I forget the exact voltage because it's not my field of expertise, but it's I want to say it's fifteen, sixteen thousand volts. It's a lot of voltage. And it can't leak through the the sole, so you still want to be careful what you're stepping on, right? But in the ideal, we need to recognize that this hazard isn't limited to the arc flash. That you have live electricity, which is a shock hazard. That you could have molten metal. We'll have molten metal if there's an arc. You could have debris being thrown if there's an arc. Okay. Right. So yeah. there's all this other stuff going on. And you need the other PPE. Right. And so you have your gloves. We talked about the gloves, and they have to have the rubber. You talked about the 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 the, the jacket, the, 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 even the boots. Now, uh, the other one is coveralls. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm wearing coveralls. What do I, do I care about what I wear underneath or do I like, I got, I got this outfit on here and, and I got my, uh, like, uh, like, uh, Bill Neitzel says, you know, I got my PPE on my suit jacket is, uh, 
is nice polyester, right? So I could just put my coveralls on this and then sit there and, and go out to work. Can I do that? Well, you can, but you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's like uh, that's a violation, of course, of both all the standards that speak to it, OSHA and common sense, and here's why. So this shirt, let's say this is an eight point whatever arc rating. It's called an eight. Uh, okay, if I'm in an arc less than eight, it shouldn't matter what I'm wearing underneath it because this not only did the igniter break open below eight, it insulated me and anything I'm wearing under it, but those calculations are all done at a certain distance, say 18 yeah. inches, 50, whatever it is. Energy falls at one over distance. Get a teeny bit closer, and the arc incident energy skyrockets. That's number one. Number two, they all assume a certain clearing time. That clearing time assumes the equipment has been exercised properly. Mm -hmm. We all know that doesn't happen in the real world. Yep. What happens if something's supposed to clear in six cycles goes eight? That's Two, two more cycles on six is 33% more energy on you. So the point is, all kinds of stuff happens in the real world that can increase the incident energy versus what you expected. And now what you're wearing underneath it is consequential. Because right. while this won't ignite or break open or melt, if I'm wearing Under Armour or a poly cotton blend or something else, and I love my Under Armour, mm -hmm. and this, this is a terrific video from a GoPro. On your left, obviously, arc-rated clothing, and on the right, non-arc-rated clothing. Now, if you... We didn't really cover this early on, so I'll, I'll circle back, cover this now. We'll circle back to the under, underlayers here. Okay. We do have good video there, by the way. Uh, the bottom line, if you've got 10 seconds to explain to somebody why they ought to wear this and wear it properly, here's your 10 seconds. Yeah. You know, or somebody in purchasing, why they ought to pay for it. Uh, well, this goes to your point. If you're not wearing an arc-rated clothing, you're wearing what? You're wearing fuel. Right. So, so let, let's take a look at all that for a minute here. We, sure. we didn't write at the outset, you know, why do you need any of this to begin with? I, I imagine some people in the audience tonight either don't have this stuff yet or have a significant wearer population that doesn't have it and should. So at the end of the day, let's take a minute here to, to talk about what's going on uh, with these videos. Okay. Uh, what we're looking to avoid is second degree burn and worse. What an arc rating is, is the amount of energy the garment can block without second degree burn. So everything you're doing in this business is, is predicated on arc rating, which is predicated on second degree burn. Let's take a look at it. What kills people in burn injury? Two things predict whether you live or die uh, what, you know, for the first week or two. What's in the burn surgeon's mind when the folks are waiting around and he comes out or the, she comes out of the surgery, is, is he going to live? Your age. The older you are, the less likely you are to survive the same level of injury and in what's called TBSA, which is total body surface area that receives either second or third degree burn. So let's talk about burn for a minute. Second degree burn, first is sunburn. It hurts, uh, but it heals. We don't measure it, it doesn't predict anything. Second degree is blisters. So now you have a blister that will typically heal without medical intervention, right? Uh, third degree burn is full thickness. The skin's died at that location, it won't grow back. You now need grafting and surgery. It's extraordinarily expensive, extraordinarily painful, and life as you knew it will never be the same. So if third degree burn, is so much different than second, how in the heck can they be the same for predicting fatality? Well, the answer, what makes them the same for predicting fatality, Tom, that drives the entire existence of the arc-rated protective business. Every fiber, every fabric, every garment, every test and standard mm -hmm. comes down to the answer to that question, which is why I was taking a minute of your life to explain it. Second and third degree burn have one thing in common, very important, they both break the skin. It is that stinking simple. When you break the skin, you have an infection path, right? Right. Where do they take you when you get hurt? Oh, hospital. to the hospital. Yeah, Germ more City. Infectious agents than anywhere on the planet, <laughs> including all the antibiotic resistant ones. So the greater percentage of your skin surface is broken open, and both second and third do that. Yep. The more pathway you have for infection, and the longer you're in the hospital around the bugs. Yeah. Yeah. So the age thing, why does age come into play? Well, the older we are, the more slowly we heal, as you and I both painfully know. Yep. But so. At the end of the day, you've got one variable you can control other than not working energized. So the key to 70, stop working energized. If you're going to work energized, recognize the hazard and stop wearing fuel because you can't do anything about your age, but you can do something about your clothing. If what you're wearing ignites, your toast, pun intended. If it yeah. doesn't and the arc rating for earlier conversation meets or exceeds the hazard, you're going home. You're not mm -hmm. going to a hospital, a burn center or more. Yeah. Well, it, now let me ask you, um, if I am wearing proper PPE, that means that I could, though, blister, right? I could get a second degree burn, but I'm not going to get a third degree burn. So in theory, yeah. The sec, this is an 8.7 calorie shirt. So 
in the laboratory, we, I will not receive a second degree burn below 8.7 calories. Ah. That's what the definition of an arc rating, an ATPV, arc thermal performance value. There's two ways to get an arc rating, arc thermal performance value and EBT or energy to break open threshold. In both cases, so let's talk about that for a minute. An arc thermal performance value, an ATPV, that result means you got to burn through the fabric before you got a hole in it. So at below 8.7 for this shirt, no, no blisters through it. Oh, okay. If the arc was below 8.7. Right. So let's say for a minute, I'm wearing this shirt. I'm unaware. It's supposed to be a six calorie arc, but I'm nine inches from it instead of 18. And now I get a 12 calorie arc, 14 calorie arc. Yeah. I'm going to get burned some, a little through this shirt, probably only in the areas of single layer fabric above the pockets and between the pockets. Yeah. So you might have a little, you know, but you still could if you don't have a base layer on. Now, 100% cotton t-shirt doesn't count toward arc rating, back to our underwear conversation. Doesn't melt. It will help insulate, but you can't count it toward the system arc rating because it is not arc rated. Okay. So, so the, the problem with a t-shirt, let's, let's think the logic through it. Go back to the base layer thing. Yep. I know we're jumping around here. No, this is perfect. I right love now, it. Right now, I'm not, not wearing a t-shirt. Don't look. <laughs> if I was, can it be cotton? Can it be meltable? Does it need to be arc rated? You cannot wear meltable base layers. Because again, let's say that the, it's an eight cycle arc where you expected six. You're at 12 where you're supposed to be at 18 inches. Enough heat gets through the garment, you can melt the meltable. Right. So that's a no-no. Cotton doesn't melt. So okay, a cotton t-shirt under here does help. You can't count it toward your system arc rating because by definition, to count toward arc rating, it has to have an arc rating. Gotcha. Flammable fabrics don't. But it is in fact uh, protective to a degree. But here's the problem with that. This shirt's arc rating is 8.7. It breaks open about 16 calories. So what happens if crazy things happen and I have an arc bigger than that? I've broken this open mm -hmm. and I've ignited the cotton t-shirt. Yeah. And that is horrible. So below the arc rating, you don't need the cotton t-shirt because your arc rating shirt does all your insulating. Right. Above the arc rating, that base layer helps insulate you some. Mm -hmm. But above break open, it could help hurt you. Yeah, so you're better off not having a T-shirt on and just relying on that because if it does break open, you'll at least, you will for a short period of time experience a burn, but it won't persist and you won't be walking away trying to put it out. Put the plane so what on. we're worried about is total body surface area. You might have a little burn where you didn't need to, mm -hmm. but if T-shirt ignites, that covers 40% of your body. And right. where does heat and fire go? Uh, you, you have three little holes you breathe through unless you're yeah. a dolphin. And they're right here. You That's don't want right. to breathe fire. You don't want fire in your face. That's right. You know, the face shield is going to protect you in the arc, but now you've got a fire going on here up, up under your face shield. Bad deal all the way around. Right. So arc rated base layers. And people did not used to want to mess with this stuff because knits, frankly, arc rated knits were not, yeah, they, they were nowhere near as good as a t-shirt. They were heavy and they were expensive and they shrunk a lot. But so a good t-shirt. Like a, not a really cheap one, but a decent, like you go, your kid has a play sports and you, you buy it or whatever, concert tee. Yeah. They're typically four and a half to five and a half ounces. Okay. And a good one is five or five and a half. This base layer, it's a cat one base layer. You can see the pad print on it. Yep. Short sleeve base layer. It's like a t-shirt, right? Yep. It's lighter, lighter than any cotton t-shirt you've ever owned. And while it's not quick dry like Under Armour, it's quicker dry than cotton. It's every bit as soft, it's lighter, it's quicker drying than cotton, and it's arc rated. Yeah, yeah. So this is a game changer. Uh, now, they're still more expensive than a, than a $20 cotton tee, you know, t-shirt, right. They're not, but not by much. Right. So these arc rated base layers have really been a game changer in that yeah, regard. But, but if you think about this equipment, you know, we look at our tools and, and, and electricians and other people will, will spend money on good tools because they're going to be using it. They should be spending on some, some uh, you know, this is what's going to protect you, right? So, yeah, yeah that T-shirt's going to be a little bit more expensive, to your point. But, I mean, you're relying on that because you just don't want to go to a burn center. That's the key. Yeah, if I'm if I'm uh, going to go parachuting, skydiving, I'm not buying my parachute <laughs> at a local, you know, I'm going to a parachute specialist, right? Yeah, well, I, you know what? I packed your, I'll, I packed your parachute. Would you would you jump out with it if I packed it? <laughs> so, um, I'll put it in, in terms I do play around with. I'm a Anyone who knows me knows I'm a shark diver. That's my, you know, my main hobby. I love it. Travel the world doing it. Um, I do not hire amateur guides. I do not hire. It's literally my life. Yeah. Their knowledge of the local waters, the local species, the local behaviors in their hands. Yeah. And I am happy to pay a few bucks more to get the best.
when it's my life on the line. Absolutely right. Now, Bill, uh, Ryan Jackson says he's heard of several times that the correct ATPV was only a 50% guarantee of a second degree burn prevention. Is that a myth? Yes and no. So if you, Tom, would, while I'm talking, would be kind enough to put up that slide that has the ARC test report Ooh, on it. Yes. That would be an outstanding. So uh, great question. Thank you. We can tee up the slide. So it is true that, uh-oh, it froze again. There it is. No, no, you're It good. is true that, um, but you, hopefully they can see this. So an ARC rating, an ATPV, is the 50% probability of a second degree burn through the fabric, or an EBT is 50% probability of a hole. So why do we do that? If you have any friends that are in the police force or military or ex-military. Well, I used to be in the Kevlar business, as I mentioned. So ballistic vests, right? There's something called a V50. That's the velocity at which 50% of the rounds penetrate the vest. I don't wanna be shot either. <laughs> so it's a statistics thing. Uh, to have 100% confidence, you need to do something like a thousand data points. Well, then the shirts would be, you know, yeah. uh, 500 bucks a piece. So at the end of the day, if you look on uh, the chart itself, the red dots at the bottom, that bottom axis, there's 21 data points when we do an arc rating. The red dots at the bottom, you didn't get a burn through the fabric or a hole in it. The red dots at the top, you did. Yep. So you see that the dots are split, you know, some are above, some are below. The computer averages that data, that's that black line that looks a little bit like an S through the middle. Yep. And where the 50% probability on the vertical axis, you come across 50% vertically down 12.4 calories, that becomes the arc rating of that fabric I never made from it. Is it good? And we're going to look at two more things here. While we have it zoomed in, if you want to zoom it back in, that's oh, yeah. perfect. Yep, yep, yep. So is that a good test? <laughs> look at the dots on the bottom axis. 10 calories, 11, 11, 12, 12 and a half. Above 12 and a half, there's no more dots anymore. Where'd they go? They're up top. What's that mean? Above 12.6, we always got a second degree burn. <sighs> look at the top axis. 17 calories on your right margin. That's 15, 14, 13, 12. Below 12, there's no dots on the top axis. Where'd they go? Down at the bottom. What's that mean? Below 12, we never got a second degree burn. This is a good tight test. The area of uncertainty is half a calorie. Half. So if you would zoom back out and look to the right there, there's like a 10, 20, 30, 40, down to 90, that piece. This is on every ARC rating report if you go hunting for it. There's your 90% confidence down there and 80% confidence and 70% confidence. Uh. So 12.4 is the ARC rating because we have to do statistics, right? Mm -hmm. A regression analysis. But at the end of the day, if you're looking for 90% confidence, it's 12.8 cows. You wouldn't want to see a test where 90% confidence was 16 calories and 10% was too, you know, it's too wide a gap. Right. A great test that narrows it down to something that's infinite, almost irrelevant in the real world. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, I'm just looking at some questions here. Um, Bill Knight, so I understand that even measuring the absence of voltage is in itself an act that requires proper PPE to verify, and that's true. Yep. You assume, I always liken it to like, you know, if you're a hunter or a, or, or a shooter, you always have to assume the gun is loaded until you verify. Same thing with this, assume it's energized until you verify. Amen. It's always, I can't tell you how many arcs we see that are caused by improper meters. You know, you put a meter across yeah. a gap to verify voltage that's too small for the gap and you cause it, right? Yeah. Too small for the voltage. Um, so yeah, confirm de-energizing and re-energizing and confirming absence of presence of voltage are all energized tasks. So the whole right. task-based thing, you no, know, drives me a little bit nuts to be frank. Task-based has its place, uh, but it shouldn't be in my view, uh, a financial decision, and especially now with COVID, you mentioned earlier the smelly, you know, you yes. don't want to share PPE. I don't want to stick my head in, in this after somebody else wore it. That's right. right. <laughs> and, and how do you disinfect this properly without damaging it? That's I mean, right. It can be done, but it's, it's you don't want to be doing it in the field with, you know, 500. So get the right PPE, wear it properly, take care of it, and don't share it. Yeah. No, you know what? So me and uh, Jimmy were doing a 70E class. And one of the, the guys in the class raised his hand. He says, when are we going to put personal back into PPE? Because his, his thought was that the, the group that he worked with, they were all sharing PPE. And he's like, you know, when you work in that stuff all day, you've got to be comfortable. You've got to feel, you got to feel good about it because otherwise you're not going to put it on. Yeah. Uh, even pre COVID, it was never a great idea. Now I get it. Yeah. You know, you got everybody in daily work. Uh, and then you have, how often you really need a 40 cal suit? So the temptation is, I'm not going to buy 140 cal suits for 100 people. I'm going to buy 
four in four different sizes and hang them near the hazard. But there's a bunch of issues with that. Hygiene is one of them. COVID is another one, obviously. Yep. But at the top of the list is, will it be where it needs to be when it's needed? And if it's not, will they go get it? Or That's will right. they work without the layering? There's case after case. Uh, Bren Brendan Schroeder's accident, uh, Cedar Rapids IBW, is a classic case of that, uh, uh, where he it was shared PPE. Uh. Uh, you know, and if they are going to go get it, what are you paying your electrician? So now they're going to stop the job. And it's going to take 20, 30, 40 minutes, whatever, to go find it, put it on, come back. And meanwhile, you're burning through money that could have been used to buy the PPE to begin with and not have to do this. That's a good point. Never thought about that. Yeah. Time is money. Absolutely. We're not paying these guys to be runway models. And the other, <laughs> so the other aspect of personal to be, um, one of the really gratifying things to see, when I started in this job uh, in the early 90s, nobody wanted to wear this stuff. You, know, no. you had really two options and neither one of them was comfortable. Uh, not, certainly none of it was stylish. It all looked like workwear. It is astonishing what is available today to the point where uh, companies like Arid, not just Carhartt, who's always been in this space, and they make terrific stuff that people love, right? Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, this Carhartt, I have to have a Carhartt 4 shirt sitting right here. You know, you can't tell it's workwear anymore. It's got all the fancy embroidery and stuff. Right. right? But So Wrangler, Ariat, I mean, the jeans... This is stuff people used to wear out to clubs on Saturday nights. There's yeah. embroidery on the back. You can't tell it's FR anymore, except for the logo on the sleeve half the time. Yeah. You know, on the, on the knit side, I've mentioned that knits were not really great for a long time, but baseball style shirts. This is a cat too, you know, long sleeve, of course, but you can't tell this stuff. It weighs the same now. It feels the same. And to the point about making PPE personal, there's so much style available suddenly that if you're into quarter zips, if you're right. into, you know, like the, the, the office business casual shirts, those things exist. If you're into plaids and lumberjack styles, those things exist. If you like baseball, you name it. If, if you can get it in non-FR style, chances are pretty good. There's yep. an FR version now. And yep. so the personal, I wouldn't just say interpersonal hygiene wise. I would also suggest strongly that whatever your style is, if your company allows, you can probably get not just comfortable with the fabric weight and feel and, and all that, but yep. the style. Yep. And now, brand. now, Bill, Bill Neitzel's asking about you. You mentioned T-shirts. What about underwear? What about bras? What about socks? You know, you. What about the, the you know the the real personal stuff that's really close to your skin? What, what about those things? I mean, are there? What do you do? So there's a little room for interpretation uh, in the, some of the standards. There, the bottom line is you're not supposed to wear meltables, right? Right. But you get 100% pair of cotton, whether it's men's or women's briefs, there is some elastic in there, in the waist and in the leg holes, right? And maybe in a few other places. Uh, that, that small amount of elastic is typically fine because it's a very low total amount. And when it's, even if it were to melt, it tends to be absorbed by the cotton. So if you go to like the Westex Ultra Soft that's so popular for so long, that's 12% nylon. How in the heck can they have 12% nylon in an FR arc rated garment? Yeah. Well, because it either ablates in the arc or there's little of it enough 12 percent and enough cotton that it's absorbed rather than melting and flowing and sticking to you so socks underwear you don't want something that's 60 percent polyester all right, right. that's going to melt and stick to you uh, but if you buy cotton briefs cotton their bras are more difficult okay uh there, it, there is more difficult to find cotton bras that said what we really worry about more oftentimes is underwire that has a tendency to superheat in an arc oh, and really cause yeah. a nice nasty little burn um, and then there are, silk is, is not, uh, it's, it's sort of flame resistant, right? But it doesn't melt. Silk is not a good thing to have on outside, but it's for the ladies who are looking for an excuse to buy silk. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not typically on uh, national YouTube television talking about bras. But <laughs> well, <you're... laughs> it's, it's important. It's important. So uh, international. <laughs> uh, international, right. So uh, at the end of the day, you want to make sure that nothing you're wearing under there, it's not that there's a multiple component. It's that there's enough of a multiple component to melt, drip, flow, and stick to you because molten polymer is essentially liquid. And many of us probably remember from high school chemistry, liquids are way more efficient at transferring heat. You right. will burn yourself a lot faster in 150 degree water than you will in 150 degree you know, rock or metal. Absolutely. So. Okay. Another question. What about earbuds? What about the, um, the, the, you know, for hearing protection, I, last I heard there's nothing that's arc resistant or anything like that. Uh, what, what does somebody do? So I want to be very careful here. Uh, what I'm about to share is purely anecdotal. That is, I can't point you to a standard. I right. can't point you to a guarantee. 
but the earplugs that are used in this industry, when we do the testing that we do with the Kima Laboratory, we repeatedly have put those earplugs, you know, drilled holes in the mannequin's ears and put them in there. Yep. Uh, we, all right, so not much of that earplug is really exposed at that point. And you're supposed to be wearing the balaclava, That's right. face shield, right? So it's very, very unlikely under normal circumstances they'd be exposed to anything. And most of them are protected by your head. We've gone so far as to put those earplugs like between the fingers of the mannequin where they're directly exposed to the arc. And they do stunningly well. Now, they would not in fire, but an arc is so brief yeah. that things like leather, which does burn, won't ignite in an arc. You could ignite it if you threw it in your fireplace, you know, for 30 seconds. But yep. so the, while arcs are super hot, super energetic, really nasty, the one thing they have going for them with regard to things like leather boots uh, or earplugs is that they're so very brief that some of these substances don't typically do bad things. Yeah. Uh, earplugs among them, at least the ones I've seen. And that And that's... That is couched with you're not you don't have flames erupt because you didn't wear the right undergarments. If you're following all of the rules and the layering rules, then the briefness of that. But if you didn't follow those rules and you have a flame going on and it's coming up to your point, then, you know, all of that goes out the window. But to your point, it's not something you can define definitively, but there's no arc resistant plugs or anything like that. If there are, I'm unaware of a standard that they'd even claim, make that claim to. Uh, Hugh Hoagland, I'm sure our audience knows Hugh. Hugh's done a lot of work like that. And, and absent definitive proof and standards, I, I trust Hugh. And when Hugh's tested something, you know, even if an ASM standard doesn't exist practically to measure it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Is there any, any, in any other video, do you want to talk about before we go on to donning and the layering aspect? Is there another video? Like, uh, you know, I... I had, so uh, cotton, yeah, let's let's go to, the, there's a one that's 100% arc rated versus 100% cotton while we're talking about undergarments. Is that, um, is that this one here? Hold I on. can't see the title, so I'm not sure, but it should be split screen and on one side will be arc rated, the other side will be 100% cotton. The title. Oh, uh, split screen. That's, 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 like, that's actually fine. That's 100% cotton. You can show that one. All right. So people, before that runs. People think cotton's okay. I can't tell you how many people we have, gas ops at utilities and other places who should know better, uh, in my view, but think cotton's okay because cotton doesn't melt to the conversation we just had. Mm -hmm. Folks, cotton has four major problems associated with it. Put aside that it's not okay with OSHA, it's not okay with NFPA 70. It doesn't meet any standards. If you say, I'm gonna go to 100% cotton, why did you just say that? Typically, it's because you believe you have a thermal hazard and you don't want meltables. Right just acknowledge you have a thermal hazard and then didn't go get the PPE. Lawyers will have a field day with that. My wife is an attorney, so you know, hopefully she can't hear me right now, but <laughs> at any rate, uh, so cotton, four things. It ignites just as easily. If it didn't burn, there wouldn't be cotton and FR cotton, would there? Right. It ignites just as easily. It burns hotter, meaning you'll do more damage to your skin more quickly. It's far harder to extinguish. If you hit a foam extinguisher with the cotton you're about to see, It'll reignite like a little trick birthday candle for your kids. Really? Uh, and yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So what, what puts out cotton? It keeps it out water. But you're not using water-based extinguishers around your electrical gear, I hope. <laughs> Fourth issue with cotton is it's heavier, meaning more fuel, longer fire, worse burn. So if you want to let this roll, anybody who thinks cotton's okay as an outer layer or even wonders what happens to it if your outer arc rate layer breaks open, cotton is nasty from the perspective of an arc. It's, I hope that's running. We'll see it's here. running. It's running. I can see the thing, so it'll come. There's, there oh, it is. There you go. So anybody who still thinks cotton's okay, I mean, that's actually not a great fire uh, to pick. I don't know why I sent that one, but it's hard to see because of the dye in that garment. That fire is not terribly bright. That's a better look at it. So you yeah. see all the funny colors from the dye and the fabric, but you're now breathing fire. You're now burning your face, which would not have been burned in the arc if you had the appropriate gear on. And you got to approach this stuff in full turnout here. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's nasty. You, you do not want any part of that as an outer layer. And if you're wearing it as a base layer, better than nothing, but only if you're absolutely certain your arc incident energy. Yeah, here's here's the one I was originally speaking of. So yeah. full 70 compliant, including the hard hat, face shield, rubber gloves, leather keepers on the left that I showed a moment ago. And on the right, cotton uh, again. And that's nasty. And you see the legs are on fire this time too. Yeah. And it not depends on the folks is not going to put this out in time to matter. No. And that, and, and then what you would see typically is somebody running and then you're trying to jump on him and cover him and then try to damper it out. And, 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 uh, and, and the whole time your skin is burning too. So, and I think this goes to your point of you know the layers and everything. I mean, that's, um, that's a critical, 
a critical aspect is making sure that um, that that you have the right layers and 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 so let's talk real quick about donning and then we'll get in uh Mathur Abbasi has uh some questions about cleaning so let's talk about donning so uh you know you said that shirt is what eight calories yeah okay so if i needed 16 calories can i put two of those shirts on in theory but the pra the, the truth is you cannot simply add the arc rating so 8.7 and 8.7 is what the 17.4 calories yep the, the, by the standards, now OSHA doesn't say this, but NFPA 70E does. By the standards, you have to actually have the test data, meaning we have to have gone to the lab and tested that fabric over that fabric. So fabric A and fabric B. And so the good news is, that's the bad news, you got to have the data. The good news is that because there's an air gap between those two fabrics when, mm -hmm. when you wear them, and because air is hugely insulative, as anybody knows who's ever looked at insulation, right, right. in your attic or whatever, the actual arc rating of this fabric over this fabric is, don't get me, don't quote me, but it's like 27 calories. Don't you quote you. 17 if you add it, but it's way higher and you want to take advantage of that. So you have to have the data. And important to point out, fabric A over fabric B, if you want to wear it B over A, you have to have the testing B over A, even though it's the same two fabrics. Ah. So in the past, that, those are the facts. In the past, it was difficult until a year or two ago for people to really take advantage of layering because... Where's the data? Yeah. Where's that data kept? If you have, if you're taking advantage of the power of choice to make people comfortable and your phone stops ringing with, I hate this, it's uncomfortable, you know. Well, now, if you got six or seven or eight shirts in your program and four or five coveralls you can wear over them and jackets, and where's, how do you possibly keep track of that layering data? How do you know that day that this garment over that garment gets you where you need to be? Yeah, it was yeah. Impossible. Well, difficult. And we yeah. had customers, and I'm not kidding, Tom, who had, like book binder clip papers on the dashboard of their trucks like that, trying to keep track of it. Wow. The good news is, and I'm going to sound commercial here and I don't mean to, Tyndale's got a lot of really, really bright computer people mm -hmm. who get bored in the summer or something. So at any rate, we have a layering app now. It's mobile enabled, cell phone, iPad, computer, and it, anything on it, all you got to do to get to it. All right, I'm, I'm, I need 12 calories. You poke eight, 10 calories or 12 or 14, right. one button, whatever calorie level you need. And then you poke one more button. Am I looking in my closet? The app knows what you own if you're a customer of ours. So only what you already own because you're going to do the work this afternoon or tomorrow. Right. Or let's say you're prepping for something you're going to do next month. Only what's in stock in my catalog. So you've poked 12 or 14 or 18 or 20 cows, whatever you need. And you've told it what to filter by, what you already own or what you have access to. And that's it. Wow. And then it populates with everything you own or everything in your catalog that would get you layered up to where you need to be. So for the first time ever, while layering was hugely valuable safety-wise, it was impractical to try and, you know, other than unless you said everybody's going to wear this shirt and that cover all and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And then, then nobody's comfortable. Yeah. Well, it, Finally, we've got a way to take advantage of layering in a way that's practical in the real world. Now, don't you see that some companies will tip? what I've seen, and I don't, I don't like to know your, your thoughts on this. What I've typically seen is like, say I have a customer of mine and they, and, and when we're designing the system, they'll say, Hey, I want either an eight cal or a 40 cal. They only dress two ways and they have, here's what you will wear for this. And here's what you will wear for this. And they train their guys on that. Is that typical? And it is. And so the, the issue there again in the past was you didn't really have a good layering option. Right. And, you know, there's a really a serious hidden danger. I did a, a webcast with uh, Rich Goydix a few weeks ago of an Espro literally on the hidden dangers of that layering. So layering's awesome, don't get me wrong, but let's think about it for a minute. So right now I've got my eight calorie daily wear. Right. I'm wearing uh, denim jeans, Ariat denim jeans and a Tyndale shirt right now. I'm eight cows, cat two, good to go. Yep. Now I, I need to be at, let's say 16. Okay, I go and I get that coverall, but my fa I still have to protect my face, right? Right. Well, all in my common sense. Guess what the cow rating is on most standard face shields if you haven't specified? It's 12. Oh. So you might have just layered up your clothing, but do you have the appropriate balaclava and face shield or not? Right, right. Are not. Chances are you don't. So to take advantage of layering between 8 and 40, you want to make sure you're also grabbing 20 cal face shield and shroud or 20 cal balaclava where you're not compliant and you're risking injury. Right. So the advantages of that, despite that hidden danger, do you really want to go put a 40 cal flash suit on when you, to work at nine calories? Well, that's, you know, no, you don't no. necessarily want to do that. So 
what a lot of people are doing now, more and more, is saying below 20 or 25, I'm going to lay. So between 8 and 20 or 25, I'm going to get a second garment and the right hard hat and face shield. But yeah. That's for other brother. Uh, and then if it's above that, they probably go and they put on their 25 cal flash suit or their 40 cal flash suit. But I got it. That gives you maximum flexibility, maximum comfort, because those other garments you use in the layer are also good as standalone garments, either in the winter when it's cold, just for thermal, yep. you know, or good on their own. Right. But you got to have the, the data. You have to have the data. So the layering app's integral, and you want to please make sure to recognize, again, not to forget the face shield and balaclava or shroud. That's right. And now, in the, what about gloves? I mean, there any issues with the gloves? So I'm not a glove expert, but okay. voltage rated gloves do go up, you know, class zero, class one with voltage. So you absolutely want to make sure it's not rated, related to arc flash incident energy. It's related to voltage there. Okay. But you do want to make sure that your rubber shock protective goods, gloves and other match the voltage, not the arc incident energy. Gotcha. Now, Bill Neitzel brings up a good point because you were talking about the layering. Okay. And, and, and what about, and, and, and you have your Tyndale stuff. What if I'm wearing... Um, uh, someone else's manufacturer's undergarment, your overgarment, and someone else's. So what about that? So I wish Sarah Steele was on the phone right now. She could give you an earful. Bottom line, the manufacturers, to your point, you're exactly right, Tom. They don't have a lot of incentive to play nice with one another. Why would company A test their stuff under or over company B's? That's where we come in. We are, I'm going to sound like a sales guy for a minute, I apologize, but Tyndale is Carhartt's largest FR distributor, Ariat's largest, Wrangler's largest, NSA's largest, Union Line's largest uh, FR distributor. So we have um, a pretty decent amount of sort of market persuasion yeah. to say our customers want to wear your shirt under his cover up right. or her shirt under your, you know. Yeah. So we have, uh, thank goodness, the industry has largely agreed to play nice and one way or another, we've been able to get a lot of data. It's not perfect. Not Every combination possible doesn't exist in the app yet. Okay. But uh, it's pretty robust. There's a lot of stuff in there. And to all the companies I just mentioned and the fabric people, you know, whether it's FLF and Mount Vernon Mills and West Tex and, and um, uh, oh, I just drew a blank on it. I can't believe I forgot for a second. There are the knit folks out in LA okay. uh, who, make, who make this super fine knit. Um, uh, but at any rate, they all play very nicely together these days when we have a direct request and we're able to test stuff oh, so do you, different brands. Do you test them? Does Tyndale do the testing? Do you, you like, do you just secure lab time and say, hey, let's throw these fabrics together? So I did that in my previous life at West Tech with Josh Moody quite a bit. At Tyndale, we use Hugh Hoagland. So it's still oh, Connectrix, yeah. of course, but we use Arcware and Hugh. Uh, we will do a little bit on our own, but most of the time we prefer to have not just third-party laboratory, which Connectrix, of course, is, but a third-party tester just because it's cleaner, right? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. We got to get it. So, now there's now you know what? That's a lead and I got to call Hugh and say, "Hey Hugh, we got to do a program, buddy." Cuz he's got a lot of good videos. He sure does. And we uh I'll plug Arc Week for a minute. So folks, if you I'm sure yes. you've seen Tom's Shock Week and that was such a cool idea that uh we shamelessly borrowed from it and created last summer Arc Week. So Arc Week is the same week as Shark Week. We drop five new episodes uh each week each summer whatever Shark Week is. Excellent. And it's Arcs and Sharks. But long story short, we're going to be filming with Hugh, hopefully live for that this summer, if, if we're allowed into Canada with COVID. Awesome. Uh, do exactly that. That's excellent. And I'll put the link to Arc Week uh, at, on, on this post. I, I didn't, I don't, I haven't put it in there yet because we were just talking about it. And I'm like, oh, crap. You know, so we have the link for that. And I have a link for a lot of your educational stuff on the testing and that. So that'll all be a part of this. Um, cool. So we talked about the layering. We talked about the different manufacturers. Now let's get into uh, cleaning your equipment because Mathur Abbasi says, can you wash with standard detergents? And I think you love those fabric softeners. So, um, <laughs> so let's- That's my wife again. <laughs> uh, I love the Palmer Hickman's classes with Tom and I sometimes teach together to, to go off on that more personal stories when we have time. But so cleaning. Let, let's get into this. Let me know, Tom, where you want more detail or whether, uh, sure. or whether I'm going too deep. So you can home launder, industrially launder, or dry clean. Why would you want to do one over the other? So people 20 years ago were worried about home laundry. Am I going to wash the FR out? As I mentioned earlier, everything that my company sells and most of what's in the American market today, the quality stuff from fabric mills you've heard of, from vendors you've heard of, is is durably flame resistant. You don't have to worry about home laundering. The, the truth is the vast majority of arc rated clothing globally is home laundered. 
Mm. So you don't need an industrial laundry. We'll talk in a minute about why you might. So the home laundering procedure, you'll see in some labels, don't use soap. What do you mean don't use soap? Well, soap, <laughs> by the ancient definition, if we were all, you know, in the 1800s or whatever, it's animal fat. Well, animal fat's flammable. So detergent, traditional detergents, whatever brand you like, are fine. Uh, there are other people will say, the labels will frequently say, don't wash them with other with non-FR clothing. I roll my eyes at that. You, people worry about flammable lint. Come yeah. on. You could take five lint traps full of lint, jam them on this, nothing's going to happen. Right. Uh, it's going to go poof in the arc. Lint is, what is it? Tiny little fibers, right? So what are they? Super high surface area, super low volume, poof, they're gone. Yep. So you don't have to segregate. Now, if, you, if you're getting into something nasty at work, you know, creosote or whatever, you don't want to cross-contaminate potentially your home laundry with, with something from work. That makes sense. But you don't have to segregate it from the perspective of worrying about flammable lint. You don't have to worry about your detergents by and large. There's two things that are prohibited, liquid chlorine bleach and fabric softener. So mm -hmm. watch Tom's face here. But liquid chlorine bleach. We're going to shout out to Hugh Hoagland and IEEE here in a minute. But liquid chlorine bleach. Who wears white? arc rated garments I don't basically know. no one no one yeah almost no one even makes white flame resistant fibers so there is one automotive company uh, i won't name who does wear white almost nobody wears white second thing who the heck bleaches colors no one <laughs> so the whole argument was a little so but all that said hugh hugh hoagland did some fantastic research a couple of years back uh published an ieee paper where he intentionally Bleach, liquid chlorine bleach, the amount you're supposed to put in a normal home laundry. Right. Not for one cycle, not for two cycles, not for five, not for 10, 50 cycles, no change in the flame resistance. Oh, wow. So I'm not advocating, do not use liquid chlorine bleach on this stuff. That said, an accidental bleaching or two or 10 at home is not going to affect the flame resistant durability of the quality fabrics that we sell. Fabric softener. Fabric softeners are mostly wax. Wax, last I checked. Correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. That's flammable, yeah? A it little bit. Back. Yeah. So, uh, in theory, <laughs> the theory went, it accretes, meaning you put it in the laundry, the fabric softener, and all of it doesn't wash off. So over time, it's building up to a level that could affect after flame. It's a flammable contaminant. So Hugh also looked at that, God bless him. And I, I believe it was 100 cycles of fabric softener, no change. Oh, really? So I'm not advocating using fabric softener, but as a quick aside... If you guys, like my wife and I, I'm, you know, I'm the ASTM chair of both the home and industrial laundering standards. It doesn't matter at home. Okay. <laughs> I'm an idiot at home. Um, <laughs> anybody who knows me knows that's probably true. But long story short, she keeps buying fabric softener and I keep throwing it out. It's 25 years now of this. Oh my gosh. Fabric softener is designed to eliminate nuisance static from synthetics. So your socks don't cling to your pants. Right. If you put it on cotton, fancy cotton towels, fancy cotton sheets, forget FR for a minute. You're putting wax on something that's designed that exists to be absorbent. I can see, I can see the arguments at your dinner table. <laughs> I, I, I kid you not, I won't name the, the brand, but she buys this little box. And by the way, right on the box, this should be illegal. My wife's an attorney, as I mentioned. It's in, in the fine print, but it's bold fine print. That's you should not be allowed. If it's in fine print, you can't go bold. <laughs> but in the bold fine print, it says not for use with children's FR sleepwear or FR workwear. Children's. Yeah, children's FR sleepwear. Uh, a lot of the ch kids' pajamas are supposed I to be I didn't know so that. Oh, okay. Wow. So she'll buy it. I'll throw it out. And a little tug of war in marriage goes on for decades. <laughs> that's a good. That's good. That's good. So I can I can launder my, my FR and my arc-resistant clothes. I'm not going to do a 40 cal outfit, right? But I will do my daily wear. You can do the 40 cal outfit if oh. you know how to take it apart properly and remove. That's actually the best way to disinfect them and clean them. Uh, you would obviously want to check with your manufacturer's directions to make sure. So the right. first thing you do is read the laundering instructions for what you own, no matter what I just said or Tom says or anyone else. Right. Uh, like Rich Goydix at an Espro or the folks at Salisbury or wherever you're getting it from. Make sure you're reading their directions. But in general, soap and water is an outstanding detergent. And water is an outstanding disinfectant for COVID, other viruses, and smelly, smelly people. <laughs> But, so can you launder it at home? Sure. Can you dry clean it? Almost certainly. Do you need to industrial launder? When people need to industrial launder as opposed to choose to, it's typically a lot of our customers, like I won't mention companies, but the nuclear folks. Well, they don't yeah. want to bring radiation home. So guess what? If we have a, a customer with 5,000 workers and 500 of them are in the nuke site, 
Those we're going to manage an industrial laundry program for them. We'll do the managing. Uh, uh, lead, one of our other customers gets into a lot of underground with lead. They don't want to bring that home. So right. if you have a toxin at work that you simply cannot bring home, that's a great reason to use industrial laundry. If you have something that you're getting dirty in that just cannot be cleaned at home, another good reason. Otherwise, an industrial laundry these days certainly isn't necessary to preserve the FR characteristics of the fabric. Certainly costs a lot of money. It's a mm -hmm. convenience, sure, but it's a very expensive convenience. And so the trend, one of the major trends in this business uh, has been away from industrial laundry and to managed care or allowance programs for those reasons. Other big trends, knits, as I mentioned, high-vis, base layers. Yeah. Uh, those are big, big things the last few years. So yeah, on the laundering, uh, that's kind of the nutshell there. Um, uh, oh, shrinkage. Shrinkage is a concern with some of this stuff. Most shrinkage happens when you over dry, meaning it's in the dryer. That's right. It's completely dry and it continues to tumble. So don't do that. <laughs> Either take it out when it's partially dry and hang it the rest of the way. Or most of the new dryers last five, 10 years, they're moisture uh, they sensors, moisture sensors anyway. Yep. Don't put it on super dry, parched desert. Put it on <laughs> you know, not so dry and you should be fine. Put it in. Don't put it on Arizona. Put it like yeah. uh, West Virginia dry. There you go. There you go. That's smart. Yeah. So, and, and, and I know our dryer does that, too, but, but I, you know, I've, I, I've always seen like those shirts that have the logos, they'll scrunch up because the heat in the dryer, to your point, it's just too dry. And then it starts to shrink up some of that stuff. And yep. yeah. Okay. So one other thought for you guys, and there's a video, if we have a few minutes, that's worth yep. looking at where you get this stuff. We've talked a lot about the stuff itself and the testing. Uh, and that's all vitally important. Your source is vitally important until we started to touch on it with industrial laundry versus managed care and all. But uh, so the good news Comfort and heat stress and all that we didn't talk about, Tom, with which I think we should for a moment, yeah, and then we'll it. go to this counterfeit idea. So there's a video called Counterfeit that we'll okay. tee up in a minute. But comfort and heat stress is this comfortable? Comfort is an inherently subjective thing. The picture of meeting room you were in, mm -hmm. uh, maybe you're in a, an environment where you can still be in with people. It's the same temperature in the city you woke up in. It's the same temperature and humidity in the meeting room. And if there's more than five or 10 people in there, you know, picture last February and before, or hopefully this September, I hope. Um, but at any rate, if there's five or 10 people in there, somebody's going to be in one layer. Somebody's going to be in two layers, you know, this plus a t-shirt. Somebody's going to be like Tom is right now, t-shirt, shirt, jacket. Yep. One layer, two layers, three layers, short sleeve, long sleeve, knit, woven, synthetic, natural. What's comfort? It's inherently subjective, day-to-day, moment-to-moment, person-to-person. In many cases, comfort is, I'm flying a brand flag I like. You know, it's yep. Carhartt, it's Under Armour, it's, it's tint, whatever. Or a color I think I look good in, or, or mm -hmm. whatever it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. So that's comfort. Does this stuff cause heat stress? Important point to make, especially coming into the summer. According to the CDC and NIOSH and OSHA, single-layer breathable apparel is not a significant contributor to heat stress. I'll say that again. Single layer breathable apparel. This, yep. Yep. whether it's arc rated or flame resistant or not, whether it's long sleeve or short sleeve, whether it's heavy or light, is irrelevant to heat stress. What causes heat stress, which is a definable medical condition that if unchecked results in you know, organ failure and death, right? we all know that. Heat stress is caused by four things primarily. Lack of hydration, yep. lack of rest breaks, lack of shade, and certain illnesses or medications. So what does all that mean? How do we dump heat? Well, we radiate heat, and when we can't radiate enough, we sweat. We all know that. Mm -hmm. Sweating and latent heat of evaporation, you dump heat, terrific, unless you aren't hydrated enough to sweat. Uh... So hydration is key. We, we, ge we generate metabolic heat, too. Let's yeah. say it's 85 degrees out, 80% relative humidity, uh, and now we're working physically. Well, there's metabolic heat. So you take a rest break to let that metabolic heat die down and you do it in the shade. The sun is a radiant heat load and you rehydrate with clear liquids. While right. You're doing it. Yep. This stuff is irrelevant at that point. What OSHA, CDC and NIOSH say about clothing, including PPE, is whenever possible, choose cotton or cotton rich products. They don't like synthetics. And they say that express because of the moisture management. Right. And they say wear light color, not lightweight, light color because it's reflective of heat. That's what they say. So again, no single layer breathable apparel is a significant contributor to heat stress. Long sleeve, which was, is what makes this less comfortable than non-arc rated clothing for right. most people, is safer for heat stress, not less safe. Why? The sun's a radiant heat load. I ah. guarantee you, if you go to the Middle East, you will not see people running around in short sleeve shirts. There's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. I never thought about that. You're right. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. So that's the comfort heat stress thing. Anybody who tells you this stuff causes heat stress more than street clothing, it doesn't. That's false. What does? Right. Rainwear, Rain 40 wear. cal suits, so multiple layer, non-breathable. But your right. basic eight cal daily wear, no. No, and 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 it's more important to hydrate and all those other things to avoid the heat stress. Correct. Hydration, rest breaks, and shade. There are certain medications and illnesses. It turns out the whole idea that your blood is thinner or thicker, you know, acclimating is real. You do yeah. acclimate to a, cli a climate. And so if somebody's moving from, let's say, Minnesota to Arizona, yeah. and they're going to work in this field outdoors, they do want to be careful the first season. It yeah. does matter. Absolutely. Uh, so on, on sourcing of this stuff. So in a world now where you have so many awesome options, there's so much, there's, there's more fibers and fabrics, there's more garments, there's more brands, there's more styles. I do this full time and I can't hardly keep up. Mm -hmm. How are you guys supposed to, right? So it's more important than ever as a result to have somebody in your company that you pay to get smart on this and stay current or somebody on my side of the fence you trust to have your best interests and your people's best interests at heart, not their profit. Right. And this is not a charity business, but the first loyalty should be to your people and their happiness, their safety first and their happiness comfort wise second. And the service is a huge piece of that. Don't cut corners here on the fibers, the fabrics, the garments, or the service, or you will live to regret it, or maybe not live to regret it if you make yeah. the wrong mistake. To that end, you want to call up that counterfeit video. Heads up, folks. There is stuff out there that is labeled flame resistant where people have faked UL certification. They've claimed certification they don't have. They've fraudulently faked the logos. Or uh, in one, in, in, like, I, I don't hate to mention the, the website, but you all know the website that people order a lot of stuff on even before COVID. So this looks exactly like a real garment from a reputable manufacturer, right on down to the same pad print I showed you all earlier. I used this shirt for a reason today, same pad print. We yeah. buy it. It doesn't come from the manufacturer it's supposed to come from. Here it is in the arc. Guess what happens? This is not a case of badly done FR that washed out after 10 or 20 launderings. This is a flammable cotton t-shirt, fraudulently misrepresented, wow. counterfeited, sold as arc rated, right on down to and including that FR Cat 1 pad print that you saw on that garment. It's not only, it's just not bad FR, it's fraud. Wow, wow. And it's, it's an absolute outrage and it's a game of whack-a-mole. So you tell the, the, the giant company we've all heard of with the smiley boxes, this is going on, and they shut it down, and a week later, they pop up under another name. Wow. So I'm begging you guys, all the stuff we talked about today is critical to its safety and, co and comfort and your satisfaction with your program. But where you get this stuff matters. So, you know, Cabela's, fine store for what they do. They don't do this. There's a yeah. store in Baton Rouge. It's a guns, ammo, and FR. I kid you not. Guns, <laughs> ammo, shooting range, <laughs> and FR clothing. Wow. They may be selling the good stuff. I don't know. I'm begging you guys. Deal with the trusted, proven people who you know what they're sourcing, where they're sourcing it, and they put your safety and your comfort ahead of their profit. Yeah, and we have from an you know you have that issue in garments. We have the same issue in electrical products, and and people say, well, how do I avoid buying a you know the the wrong product? And the only way is by you know, buying it from authorized dealers, buying it from, you know, who are you getting it from? If you're buying it on online, if you're buying it, uh, you know, like you said, from these places that aren't the authorized distributors of those products, you really don't know what you're getting, right? Yeah. And it's hard to tell. I mean, I know from an, from like circuit breakers, we have, we have uh, in our experience center, we've got like a set of circuit breakers. Some of them are counterfeit. And I'll tell you what, Scott, I look at them and I can't tell. I mean, I'm looking and then and then all of a sudden you go, hold on. You know, the one was real obvious. I mean, everything was looked, everything looked great. And then I, I noticed they spelt eaten wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, that. Yeah. Wow. But but yeah, the, the only way you would have been able to tell with the garment I just showed you, if you look at the company rating, it was like 97%. The grading for the garment was like a half a star. Yeah. That could give you a clue. But otherwise, the only way you know is when it's too late. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, be really careful, folks, where you get the stuff from whom you get it. Um, the perfect. best defense here, again, besides the stuff I've already talked about, write a tight spec, monitor that spec, deal with trusted people. Yep. And uh, okay, so we did a, a lot. And um, I'm just calling up something here. So we went through everything I think we wanted to cover. We we did it. We we went over an hour, but that's fine. And I know you got and, and you know everybody, you know, I love your energy and all that good stuff. So 
But and uh, the only last bit of this discussion <laughs> is your entry into the Buck Forty One Club, and I got your I got your Buck. And I got your 41, and I'm going to mail it to you. Like, I'm going to mail Jimmy his. And and you know what? I just got these coins, which this is a dollar coin, which is kind of cool because it's New Jersey. And it's got a picture of a light bulb on the back. Okay, so I might replace the the this with a, with all coinage. So Oh, I know Jimmy and I are Philly boys, man. We don't. <laughs> oh, that's right. This is a joy. So this is even better. This is even better because now it's like rubbing salt, right? But uh, but anyway, so oh. I I did a write up in here just because I know you and all of this good stuff. So you know you're out there on the Buck Forty One Club. You're joining an elite team. Um, so and it, and what you do is you come up to a Buck Forty One and just go to Buck Forty One tdimitrovich.com slash buck41 and I haven't put your picture there to get the link but that's going to be next so <laughs> oh, I'm honored thank you very much no I, I appreciate you uh, you coming on and I know you've got your your daughter's uh, something going on so I got a birthday right 21st birthday and just graduated University of Florida in only three years so it's a wow. yeah you just got back in town we're going to celebrate both in a few minutes here you know you know college you know my my uh my college was the, or, or actually maybe it was eighth grade was the best three years of my life. <laughs> no. I might have spent eight or 10 years in college for various reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. They evened it out for me. Yes. So I, I don't, that, that buck 41, I don't have to declare that on my taxes this week, do I? Um, you know what? No, not if you, uh, not if you donated back. No. There you go. <laughs> no, but uh, buck 41, it's, it's, it's below the limit. So I, I strategically selected. So, but I appreciate, I appreciate you, Scott. I appreciate what you do for the industry. And I love your passion and I love your knowledge and, and I've watched you in action. And I think everybody out there, we got Steve Froming, Bill Neitzel. We had uh, Tamaki uh, online from, um, from, uh, uh, we yes yeah, so from, from Japan. And uh, so there's Tamaki Ono. We have Felix Sandoval. So, you know, we had a, a lot of good, and this is going to be out on on my YouTube channel. Uh, and if and if people are you know try to find uh, or just do a pound eating tech talk, they can find it. So um, it's out there on my YouTube channel, on my LinkedIn and Facebook. We streamed all three of those platforms, and it's it's going to be out there. So I you know I think it, it was a really I, I enjoyed the session personally, and I learn every time I I talk to you about this stuff. So Bill Knight, really yeah, thanks Tom. I, I really yeah. appreciate the opportunity to come chat with you. Uh, you know, Eden, it's, it's an awesome company. What you're doing in particular, it's, you're the thought leader around here. What you do, nobody else is doing at this level. It's awesome to watch. I appreciate it. You know, a privilege to be a part of it. Uh, the, the facility in St. Louis there with the, it's probably the only privately held arc box in, in the country, I'm guessing. Yeah. We built ourselves one, but we have to borrow Kima's facility to use it, to energize it. <laughs> yeah, what, what you guys do is just, just terrific. And I've really enjoyed every opportunity when it was back when it was Cooper now when it's Eaton to work with you and your folks. Excellent. So thank you again for the opportunity and uh, yeah, anything I can do anytime. I, happy to help. I appreciate that very much. And you know, I'm a fan of Tyndale. So, uh, and I, and I, and I appreciate all you guys do and, 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 and bring to the table. So, and, and if they're paying you to go around the country and do what you do and dive for sharks, it's got to be a good organization. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't quite worked around and getting paid to dive with sharks yet, but uh, <laughs> this summer, if COVID lets me, I'm going to. I figure all the people get paid to play golf. Why not? Where's, where's my turn here? That's exactly so right. As a quick heads up, uh, we will be back at Kima if COVID lets us in the yeah. spring. And anybody who wants to come see this live, you know, to create arc after arc after arc with the new arc box, we can do it, you know, every couple of minutes. It's not wow. 20 minutes in between anymore. And ideally we'll be there in April or May if the world opens up. So where's Kima at? Tell everybody where's Kima's at. It's a little, just outside Philadelphia. It is one of the few places uh, in, on the planet, really, where we can go connect a piece of equipment to 480 and blow stuff up over and over other than obviously the Eaton facility in St. Louis. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that one's indoors, right? This one is outdoors, so we don't have the smoke issues to, that can maybe obscure what we're looking to show because we're trying to burn things on purpose, right? Right, right. So, uh, yeah, that's why we, in addition to what we've done with you you guys and with Palmer Hickman and the ETA at Coop, at, at your Eaton facility in St. Louis, Yep. this one came as outdoors. Cool beans, yeah. And it's in Philly, so, I mean, but but I always recommend people visit Pittsburgh first before they go to Philly, so. My son's in Pitt. Hi, Ryan. There we go. Hey, Ryan. Good to see you, brother. And happy birthday to your daughter, who... What's her name? Amy. Amy. Happy birthday, Amy. 21. 
go have a beer on uh, on Scott tonight. I'm pretty sure that's where she's headed. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Scott. I really appreciate it. Great uh, session. And I think you're getting a lot of thank yous out there, Ryan Jackson, everybody. And uh, so we're going to close this up and tell everybody to have a, a good thing. Any closing words? Before? Stay safe. Don't wear fuel. That's stay safe. Don't wear fuel. I love it. All right, brother. I'm going to just put us into studio mode and I'm going to do our little closing thing here. So thank you and take care. And everybody out there, stay safe. And remember, please stay healthy until uh, today is Tuesday, Thursday. Remember, our, we're going to do arc resistant equipment on Thursday. So I got uh, our, our uh, Matt uh, Hussey and we should have a great session then as well. All right. Thank you, Matt Rabasi and everybody else for joining in. Take care, stay safe and please stay healthy. All right, I'm going to just mute us here and then I'm going to give it.